Orenco Systems Intermittent Sand Filter. Advanced wastewater treatment for sensitive home sites. Have you ever wondered what happens to the wastewater from your dishwasher, bathroom sink, washing machine, or bathtub after it goes down the drain? <laughs> Probably not, because out of sight, out of mind. If you lived inside a large city, you'd be connected to the city sewer, and all of your wastewater would go to a treatment plant where it is treated and cleaned before being returned to the environment. But you aren't connected to the sewer. You have a septic system located on your property. To be more specific, you have, or are about to install, an intermittent sand filter, or ISF system. You might think of it as your very own sewage treatment plant that will safely treat your wastewater before returning it to the environment. Conventional septic systems have only two components, a septic tank and a drain field. If your home site has poor soil, high groundwater, or other limiting conditions, such a system may not provide adequate treatment. Because it can fail and create a health hazard, you may be required to have a more advanced treatment system. Your ISF system provides advanced treatment to protect your family's health and the environment, prevent system failure, and allow you to build where you couldn't otherwise. Although ISF systems come in many different configurations or layouts, there are three main components common to all systems. There is the septic tank with its pumping assembly, the sand filter, which consists of a tough flexible liner, much like a swimming pool liner, that contains two layers of gravel, a two-foot layer of sand, a layer of pea gravel with a network of distribution pipes, and in the center, a pump chamber. This is all covered with filter fabric, a layer of soil, and your lawn. The third component is the drain field. Except for the access covers, everything is hidden below ground. Here's how your ISF system works. Wastewater flows from your home through the drain pipes and into the septic tank. Here, heavier solids settle to the bottom, forming a layer called sludge. Lighter solids and greases float to the top and form what's called the scum layer. The sludge and scum decompose slowly and every so often need to be pumped from your tank. Between the solids layer is a zone of relatively clear liquid called effluent that is pretty much free of solids. It's this effluent that is pumped to the ISF for treatment. The effluent is pumped periodically from the septic tank to the sand filter, where it is dispersed uniformly over the filter surface through a series of distribution pipes, perforated with small evenly spaced holes. As the effluent trickles down, microorganisms in the layers of gravel and sand break down the pollutants transforming it into relatively clean water. At the bottom of the filter, this cleaned up wastewater is collected and pumped to a simplified drain field. There, it is discharged through a buried pipe or network of pipes and receives additional treatment from microorganisms in the soil. Like any household appliance, your ISF system needs some regular maintenance to keep it operating properly. Here are some basic tips for caring for your system. Never flush anything down the drain, except toilet paper, that hasn't been ingested first. This includes diapers, sanitary products, cigarette butts, hair, and any plastics. Your septic system is a living environment, so avoid excessive use of chemicals and cleaners that can kill the naturally occurring bacteria that treat the wastewater. Occasional use of bleach and laundry is acceptable, but avoid using automatic toilet bowl cleaners, which continuously feed bleach into the septic tank. Do not dump cooking grease and other oils down the drain. They will clog up an ISF or any other kind of on-site system. Garbage disposal should not be used because they increase the need for tank pumping and general maintenance. 
Hot tubs or large indoor spots should not be drained into the septic tank, as the extra water may overload the system. If you use a water softener or water purifier, do not drain the backwash into your septic tank. It is safe to discharge it directly into the ground. A complete description of the proper use and simple annual maintenance can be found in OSI's ISF Operation and Maintenance Manual. If you perform this annual maintenance or contract with a qualified service company to perform it for you, your ISF system will operate successfully for many years to come. During the 24-hour period, the amount of wastewater entering the septic system is highly variable. Peak flow periods are typically in the mornings, evenings, and weekends, when families are taking showers, doing the laundry, and washing dishes. At night, when people are sleeping, and during the day while people are at work and school, there is less flow to the septic system. In an intermittent sand filter or ISF system, one of the goals is to manage these variable flows so that the effluent is pumped to the sand filter evenly throughout the day. The space in the septic tank that stores the wastewater that accumulates during peak flows we call the surge volume. It works much like a dam, which stores up water behind its floodgates during the rainy season so that it can release a consistent flow all year around. The flow of wastewater through the septic tank is controlled by two liquid level float switches located in the tank and a programmable timer located in the control panel. Here's how it works. At the lowest level of the surge volume, the bottom or timer float is in its off position, making the timer inactive. The liquid level is normally at this position in the early morning hours when no water is being used. As the incoming flow raises this float to its on position, the pre-programmed timer instructs the pump to begin sending microdoses of filtered effluent intermittently to the sand filter. The peak inflow that typically occurs in the morning and evening usually exceeds outflow to the sand filter, and the septic tank surge volume begins to fill. The timed microdoses will catch up during periods of lower water use, dropping the liquid level in the septic tank until it reaches the timer off float that deactivates the programmable timer and prevents further dosing until the liquid level rises again. Even though the levels in the septic tank rise and fall over the course of a 24-hour period, the distribution of effluent to the ISF is kept consistent by the programmable timer. Occasionally, when more sewage enters the tank than the surge volume can store, the liquid level rises to the top float, which immediately turns on both the pump and the high water alarm. The pump disperses effluent to the ISF, quickly lowering the level in the septic tank until the top float drops to its off position, usually within two minutes, and the alarm shuts off. Infrequent short-term high water alarm conditions are normally nothing to worry about, especially if they coincide with overnight guests or occasional parties when use of the septic system is greater than usual. Frequent and or continuous alarms usually indicate a problem with the system that needs to be checked. They can be caused by leaky faucets, a running toilet, or too many loads of laundry in a short period of time. In most systems, a third float is located below the two main control floats. Its redundant off function protects against the pump running dry, and its low-level alarm is an alert for problems such as siphoning, a leaking septic tank, or that maintenance may be needed. This alarm lets the homeowner know to contact the system's installer or servicing company. How do ISF systems accomplish such a high level of treatment? First of all, an efficient distribution manifold ensures that all, not just part of the filter bed, is involved in the treatment. But the real key to efficiency is microdosing. Small volume doses allow effluent to move slowly around the sand particles, with plenty of time for natural bacterial reduction to take place. By contrast, large doses that flood the system cause effluent to percolate so rapidly through the sand, there's not enough contact time for adequate treatment. The effluent from an ISF system has received such advanced treatment that it's often hard to distinguish from tap water. That clear effluent also doesn't form a restrictive biomat 
like the one that occurs in conventional septic tank drain fields. Therefore, ISF effluent can be discharged safely into a short, shallow, gravelless drain field. Such shallow trenches are often only one-tenth the length of a conventional drain field and one-third to one-half the width. This makes installation in sensitive sites easier and eliminates the need to destroy existing landscaping or trees. Placing the treated wastewater into the top 12 inches of the soil, where a majority of soil organisms live and where plant roots drink, allows final polishing, bacterial reduction to near zero, and the potential for substantial nitrogen reduction. Advanced wastewater treatment with an ISF system protects public health and the environment. The installation of the OSI intermittent sand filter system can be broken down into three distinct parts. The septic tank with the pump system and control panel, the intermittent sand filter itself, and the drain field or reuse component. To make the installation easier and help ensure the homeowner gets a long-lasting trouble-free system, OSI offers a complete ISF equipment kit. In most cases, the kit includes all of the required components except the locally acquired materials such as the septic tank, external piping, plywood framing, filter media, and electrical wiring. Once the watertight septic tank has been properly set in its desired location, the access risers need to be securely fastened to the tank. This tank has built-in PRTA tank adapters that the risers connect to. Included with the OSI kit, is an adhesive used to bond the riser and adapter together, either ADH-100, a single component material in a caulking tube, or the two-part MA-320 that comes pre-measured in its own mixing bag. To use MA-320, remove the plastic divider rod and thoroughly mix the two ingredients inside the bag until the adhesive reaches a uniform white color. Cut the corner of the bag and apply a solid bead of adhesive around the top perimeter of the adapter. Carefully slide the riser over the adapter, orienting the grommets in the desired directions. Make sure the riser is level and fully seated on top of the tank. To ensure a watertight seal, apply a bead of adhesive in the groove formed by the inside of the riser and top of the tank adapter, and then smooth it out using a tongue depressor or putty knife. If the precast riser adapter is not available, one can be attached to the tank with a bolt-down kit. Riser adapters are also available to accommodate square or rectangular tank openings. After the adhesive hardens and the riser is secured firmly in place, but before backfilling, the tank and riser connection must be water-tested. This test is accomplished by filling the tank with water up to a level of two inches above the riser adhesive joint. A new concrete tank will absorb water so let the tank sit for 12 to 24 hours and then refill it to two inches above the riser. When you check the water level again, after waiting at least two hours, it should be two inches above the riser. If it is lower, you have a leak in the tank or riser and will need to take corrective action. Absolutely no leakage is acceptable. To place the splice box, lubricate the box's nipple and grommet with Vaseline or vegetable paste. Push the nipple through the grommet. It is essential that the splice box fits flush against the riser so that the pump ball can be easily removed for maintenance. This splice box will be used to safely connect incoming power and control wires to the pump system. Before placing the biotube pump ball in the tank, install the support pipes. To do this, back the screw out of each support pipe, slide the pipe through the bracket, and then reinsert the screws. The support pipes are free to move back and forth a few inches to accommodate the vault placement within the riser. Carefully lower the vault into the tank. The support pipes will rest inside the riser and on top of the tank. Screw the discharge assembly into the pump and lower it into the biotube pump vault. Lubricate both the discharge nipple and grommet. Push the nipple through the grommet, orienting the ball valve flush with the riser so that the vault and filter cartridge are readily accessible. 
The discharge assembly has several threaded joints for flexibility in achieving a good fit without cutting or gluing. Lower the quick release float assembly into the vault and snap it into the holster style bracket. Make sure the floats are positioned at the correct elevations and that they are oriented so they do not interfere with each other. Remove the lid of the splice box and bring the ends of the float and pump cords through the cord grips in the sides of the splice box. The ends of the float cords are color-coded for easy identification during wiring, testing, or troubleshooting. Do not shorten any of the cords as the extra length allows for equipment removal without disconnecting any of the wiring. All of the electrical work must be performed by a person qualified and certified to do such work. After the electrical conduit is run from the control panel to the splice box, the wires inside the splice box are connected using the heat shrink butt connectors and watertight wire nut provided. Because moisture may be present inside the splice box, never use standard house wiring nuts. After the splicing is completed, tighten the cord grips. Pull moderately to ensure that they are tight enough that the cords cannot be easily pulled loose. Replace the lid on the splice box with the four stainless steel screws. Neatly wrap the extra cord links and place them around the splice box or next to the riser wall. Adhesive-backed Velcro works well to hold the cords next to the splice box. Place the fiberglass lid on the riser and secure it with the stainless steel bolts provided. The control panel is the brain that operates the ISF system. The wiring from the pumps and floats enter the panel through electrical conduits where they connect along the terminal block. This is the prepared excavation for the sand filter. The bottom of the excavation is smooth and flat except for the depression in the center where the drain field pump basin will be located. A 2x4 and plywood framing wall is used to hold the liner in place during construction. Treated lumber is not required because once the system is backfilled, the wood will decompose and the liner will be supported by the soil. When building the wood walls, it is important to nail from the inside out so that there are no sharp points exposed to damage the liner. A two-inch layer of sand is spread over the bottom of the excavation prior to installation of the liner to protect it from sharp objects. Additional sand can be placed in the center depression to assure that the pump basin will sit at the proper height. Drawn on the exterior of the liner are the dimensions and orientation arrows for easy reference. The pouch attached to the liner also contains instructions. Unfold the liner and drape it over the sides of the walls. Once completely open, make sure there is ample material to lay down in the pump basin depression. Carefully work around the perimeter of the sand filter, working the liner up against the framing wall so that there are no gaps. Any extra material should be neatly tucked into the corners. Next, place the pump basin in its depression with the underdrain grommets oriented in the proper direction. After connecting the sections of 4-inch slotted PVC underdrain pipes with slots aligned, insert them through the basin grommets so they penetrate the pump basin by approximately 1 inch. The slots should be facing up and tipped to the right or left, with the slots of the two underdrain sections facing opposite directions, one to the left and one to the right. Place the end caps in the open ends of the underdrain pipes. To make installation of the different layers of media within the liner easier, use a paint pen to mark the elevations of media layers around the perimeter of the liner. Being careful not to crush or damage the underdrain pipes, place one half to three quarter inch diameter rock around them to prevent finer material from entering the slot. Place a level layer of 1 quarter to 3 eighths inch pea gravel 8 inches deep. The pea gravel keeps the treatment sand above the saturated zone of the underdrain, preventing anaerobic conditions in the bottom of the sand. 
Once the pea gravel has been smoothed out, an optional air coil is laid into place. If, at a later date, it is determined that a problem has developed with the sand media, such as overloading, air can be forced through the filter to help revive it. The air coil is cheap insurance if a problem develops. The next layer is the filter sand. It is essential that this material meet the required specifications and should be pre-certified by the sand supplier. An excess of very small particles, called fines, can doom an otherwise perfectly built sand filter. Once the sand is on site, a quick test, called the jar test, can be performed to check that the sand is not too dirty. To perform this test, fill a quart jar with two inches of sand. Then fill the jar about three-quarter of the ways with water. Shake the jar vigorously and let stand for about one hour. Less than one-eighth inch of silt should settle out on the top of the sand. Although the jar test provides a rough gauge to the cleanliness of the sand, it is not a substitute for the wet sieve analysis certification of the sand. To ensure proper compaction and prevent settling problems, the 24 inches of filter sand must be damp when placed. The top of the sand layer must be even and level. This can be accomplished using a method similar to screeding concrete. Three inches of pea gravel are then placed on top of the compacted sand, trying to disturb the sand as little as possible during the process. The gravel is then leveled to provide an even surface to support the sand filter manifold. Before assembling the sand filter manifold, lay all the pieces out in the proper position on top of the gravel. The manifold pieces are labeled with corresponding letters for easy assembly. A goes to A, B to B, and so on. Be sure all the orifices are pointed in the required direction as defined in your installation manual. Remove the end plugs just prior to gluing to prevent dirt and gravel from entering the pipe. Using proper gluing techniques, including the use of primer, assemble the manifold. Use small glue daubers, as excess glue from large daubers may flake off and potentially clog orifices. The ends of the manifold laterals are equipped with clean-out valves. Once in place, a valve box is placed over each clean-out for protection and to provide easy access for the annual maintenance. The pumping equipment for the pump basin is installed in a similar fashion as shown earlier for the septic tank. It is very important that the floats in the pump basin are positioned correctly so that the liquid level at the bottom of the filter does not reach the bottom of the treatment sand. With the manifold in place, connect the transport line from the septic tank pump system to the inlet fitting on the manifold. The pump can now be turned on to flush the piping and manifold clear of any debris. After flushing, shut the clean-out ball valves at the ends of the laterals. Then turn the pump back on to check that all the orifices are unimpeded and that the required orifice residual pressure is met. Measuring the height of liquid in a clear pipe at the end of a lateral provides the most accurate method of measuring this pressure. Normally, a height of five feet or greater is required. Measuring the squirt height directly out of one of the orifices will normally give a height that is close, but slightly lower than what the clear pipe will show. The measured pressure should be recorded on the front of the O&M manual and in the control panel for future inspections. If the residual pressure measures higher during annual inspections, some of the orifices are plugged and lateral cleaning is necessary. After the pressure test has been completed, Orifice shields are snapped in place over all the orifices. These patented shields prevent the pea gravel from obstructing the orifices. If the orifices are facing down, shields with slots are placed on the bottom side of the laterals. Before the cover layers of the sand filter are placed, connect the pump basin electrical and discharge lines. The electrical conduit goes to the control panel location and the discharge line goes to the drain field area. Once all piping and laterals have been positioned correctly and pressure tested, they are covered with a three-inch layer of pea gravel. 
filter fabric is placed over the layer of pea gravel to keep the soil from moving down and possibly clogging the sand filter. This lightweight fabric is porous enough to allow air and water to pass freely. A final 6 to 8 inch layer of loamy soil or sand is used to cover the sand filter for protection and odor prevention. This final cover is slightly sloped to promote runoff and prevent ponding of water on top of the sand filter. Grass is planted over the top, allowing the sand filter area to be used as a lawn. Although standard drain field trenches can be used following a sand filter, shown here is a shallow gravelless drain field that takes advantage of the high level of treatment the effluent receives from a sand filter. This pressurized drain field is prepared by excavating a trench 12 inches wide and 10 inches deep. As with any drain field trench, the soil must not be smeared. A 1 inch diameter drain field pipe with 1 8 inch orifices on 2 foot centers is laid in the trench. After the transport line from the sand filter pump basin is connected to the drain field pipe, a pressure test is conducted. Normally, an orifice pressure of only two feet is allowable because the sand filter effluent is very clean and there is very little chance of orifice clogging in the drain field. Half pipe, 12 inch diameter pipe that has been cut in half, is placed in the trench over the drain field pipe. Six inch diameter inspection ports are placed along the length of the half pipe. The half pipe is then backfilled with native soil. These shallow drain fields have proven successful without freezing even in cold climates such as Montana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Quebec. Before system startup, the floats in the septic tank and the sand filter pump basin should be checked for proper setting and proper operation as described in the O&M manual. Also, the programmable timer in the control panel must be set for the expected system daily flow. This information is recorded on the front page of the O&M manual for future reference and inspections. The annual maintenance recommended for OSI ISF systems requires only a few tools and normally will take no longer than 30 minutes. Recommended maintenance includes visual inspections, flushing of the sand filter laterals, a squirt test before and after flushing, and verification of proper pump operation. Flushing of the sand filter laterals is performed simply by turning on the pump in the septic tank and then alternately opening and closing the ball valve at the end of each lateral. Using the elbow fittings provided, the effluent is flushed into the clean-out valve box. After lateral flushing, the orifice residual pressure, or squirt height, is checked using a clear pipe as was done during system installation. If the residual pressure measures higher during the annual inspection than the O&M manual shows during startup, some of the orifices are plugged and lateral cleaning is necessary. Lateral cleaning can be performed with a bottle brush snake or a high pressure jetter hose. By following the installation, operation and maintenance information presented in this video and the O&M manual, your ISF system should provide you with worry-free wastewater treatment for years to come. For more information about Orenco Systems intermittent sand filters, call your nearest distributor or call Orenco Systems 1-800-348-9843. Orenco Systems, changing the way the world does wastewater.